as we look at a passage today where there's some cleaning that takes place. You know, there are people who like to clean. How many of you love to clean? Those of you who don't like that, look around real quick. Just, make, just see who's there. I'm not one of those people who like to clean. I find there's a basic problem with cleaning. Whatever you clean gets dirty again. I suppose if you like to clean, that's a good thing because then there's always something that needs to be cleaned and you're happy. As we move to the last half of John chapter 2 this week, we need to slow down today. To slow down and uh, to rest with uh, what we read there, to make sure we don't miss the significance of what Jesus does. When he enters the temple in Jerusalem and he proceeds to clean house. If you can place yourself into the account, it has incredible power to change your life. It's not just a story about what Jesus Christ, the Son of God, did 2,000 years ago in a temple in Jerusalem. We're going to see how God can work in our lives as He transforms us into people, people who will serve and honor Him with our lives. And so your willingness to step into the scene, that's essential to be able to benefit from the lesson that Jesus teaches there. We saw Jesus last week at a high time of celebration. He was at a wedding in Cana. We reconnect with Jesus and some of the family members and those first followers as they are now enjoying a break. John 2.12 says, after this, he went down to Capernaum with his mother and his brothers and his disciples and there they stayed for a few days. They went down to Capernaum because it's at a lower elevation since it's near the Sea of Galilee. You know, we're accustomed uh, when we use those kinds of terms. We talk about going up north. In the summer, it's a good thing to go up north or down south. And by about Wednesday morning, a lot of us will be wishing we were down south. And so they oriented themselves in that time by altitude rather than direction. We do it by direction. I don't know how that's handled south of the equator. I, do they go up south? south the, or have we forced the northern hemisphere bias onto them? I think there should be an up-south movement that we start, uh, maybe. Uh, that's just my crazy thoughts. In the next verse, they're going to be headed south where Jesus will go up to Jerusalem. Keep this in mind as you visualize the events as they're described by the gospel writer. Because Passover is coming, Jesus knows there are some really big days ahead for him. The Jews prepared for Passover like we prepare for Christmas. There was a spirit of expectancy that month before Passover. Uh, they began to do road and bridge repairs so that the crowds and the animals who were proceeding toward Jerusalem, that they could be accommodated. Uh, there's no record of what Jesus and his company did for these few days, but they had these few days together just to have a break because Jesus, he knows how to pace life. A good example for us. So said, Passover is a big deal for the Jews. This is going to mark another major turning point for Jesus. In verse 13, when it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Uh, Passover, uh, if you haven't seen one of the uh, Moses movies lately, celebrates the night the angel of death visited Egypt, bringing that tenth plague of death on the firstborn. However, the angel passed over the houses of Israel where they had placed the blood of the lamb on the doorpost. And so this was an event the people, they were commanded to celebrate every year so they would never forget the significance of being delivered by God through that shed blood. We know Jesus' family had been in Jerusalem for Passover before. They'd gone when Jesus was 12 years old, of course. Uh, that was the time it's a good thing there wasn't social services at that time because the parents had left Jesus behind, 12-year-old Jesus behind for three days in the temple. And when they came back, they found him engaged in discussions with the Jewish legal experts who were amazed at his knowledge of Scripture. 
We don't know how often Jesus was in Jerusalem for Passover. We don't know that precise number. It would have been often. It was required that every Jewish male who lived within 15 miles would be there every year. Others who were farther out, they could come too. And so they often did. So Jerusalem, it's estimated Jerusalem had around 200,000 inhabitants at that time. During Passover, there would be two to three million people there as they celebrated God's miraculous deliverance. The St. Cloud metro area, the larger area, has just over 200, I think you said that, Dave, 204,000 is the kind of the population. Can you imagine what it would be like if there were two to three million people who descended upon our area for a week? Wouldn't that be fun? It would be a circus is what it would be. And that was certainly the case in Jerusalem. As Jewish males, as they came to the temple, they were required to pay the temple tax and to offer a sacrificial animal for the forgiveness of sins. This is the first of three Passovers recorded by John. Uh, the second one is in John 6, just after the feeding of the 5,000. The third time is in John 12, and that's the one that's also found in the other Gospels, all the events leading up to the arrest and the crucifixion of Jesus. Now with any event, if there were two to three million people coming to St. Cloud, there would be some enterprising business people who would make the most out of it. With any event like that, it was a time predictably abused by enterprising people with so many shekels to be made. There were always people who would find a way to do that, and it turns out some of the most devious methods were devised by the religious leaders at the temple. The Passover events in the first century, they were a polluted version of what God intended to be a solemn, holy celebration. The corrupt priesthood had turned the temple into a greedy money grab. This is the scene that John describes when Jesus walked into the temple. In the temple courts, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and others sitting at tables exchanging money. The, the temple courts, it was a mixture of a religious celebration and a swap meet. It was actually called the Bazaar of Annas. Annas, who was the former high priest, he had been removed from his position by the Roman government because they thought he had too much power. And power was obviously something that he knew because he continued to call the shots through a successive line of puppet priests, mostly members of his family. Greed, greed was at the center of everything being done and the power that was there was the means to make it all possible. Annas operated pretty much unchecked, much like a mafia godfather would run his operation. And so the required temple tax, it had to be paid in Jewish shekels. No Roman, no foreign currency accepted. And so the people coming, they had a problem because all they had was shekels. So the earnest worship, or, or foreign money, they needed the shekels. So the earnest worshiper had to find that currency. And where a problem exists, there's always opportunity that abounds. And so Annas and his henchmen, also known as priests, set up stations in the temple courts where money could be exchanged. Now, this practice probably started, it was probably a consideration at first. People are going to need this. It probably started out with good intent. But that good intent had long ago eroded into an extortionary abuse with exchange rates requiring two to three times the value of the coin received in return. Uh, the required half shekel would have been equal to about two hours of work for the common laborer. When the exchange rate was put in, the equivalent of about two days' wages was required to be able to give that coin. The other requirement for worshipers was an animal that had passed inspection. It was deemed suitable to be offered for sacrifice. Animals were to be without defect. And whether they were or not, that was something determined by the priest. Now, for those who lived within, say, 15 miles, they could have easily brought their own animals with them. Others coming longer distances 
might not have been as easy. So again, animals were made available to those people who needed them to purchase upon arrival in Jerusalem. Again, probably it was a considerate gesture at first, a way to help. But it didn't take long before even an animal that had been brought from closer by, that animal that had been closely inspected by the owner, when they arrived at the temple, it would be found to have defects. And so the animal vendors would then offer to sell a new animal at highly inflated prices, or they would accept that imperfect animal as a trade along with a transaction fee. Somehow, later, those imperfect animals later turned into perfect animals that could again be traded then to other worshipers. It was a perversely genius racket where everything came at a price. A price that couldn't be avoided because there were religious requirements that the Jews, they, they really they were serious about keeping those. Estimates range. I found different ones. Uh, some said the priests could bring in about $200,000 during that week. Other estimates ran as high as $2 million could be brought in during that week. Uh, we'll talk about this at our board meeting tomorrow night if there's something we might be able to adopt from that. <laughs> Whatever the, op whatever the number, the money-making possibilities, staggering. And so Jesus is walking into the court of the Gentiles. The court of the Gentiles was a place set aside for those who were earnestly seeking God where they could be welcomed. And what he found was this bizarre, bizarre, that's what he sees. This is how Chuck Swindoll sums it up. This is what Jesus had seen each year as he and his family visited the temple to celebrate festivals, observe sacrifices, and glorify God. This year, like all the others, he found not a place of worship, but a shameless sham, a shrine to greed and a sanctuary for thieves. Only this year, something was different. And the something different is Jesus. John 2, verse 15. So he made a whip out of cords and drove all from the temple courts, both sheep and cattle. He scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. To those who sold doves, he said, get these out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a market. If you've ever had any image of Jesus where he comes even close to being a wimp, you need to erase that thought. As you imagine him demanding all of these people to cease and desist while he drives them and the animals out of the temple. He was a powerful man. He was a one-man wrecking crew. That leaves me with questions. What caused this anger? And if you were one of the disciples where you've just started following this man and you're watching this, how would you have felt at that moment? That first question, part of what made Jesus so angry was how the religious leaders had ignored the teaching about Passover in the Old Testament. Deuteronomy 16 teaches they weren't supposed to even eat bread with yeast during those seven days. It was a way to remember the urgency with which they had to be ready to leave Egypt. And it was also that preparation for the required sacrifice because unleavened bread, part of that preparation, yeast was a symbol of uncleanness, of evil. And so Jewish families getting ready to go to the temple to worship at Passover, they were to search their houses to make sure that all yeast had been removed because there could not be any impurity. And then Jesus walks into the temple of God and he sees his father's house, a place designed to be filled with the glory of God. It is filthy with greed and extortion. And with that, there are some valuable lessons that we can learn. One lesson is there is a right way to be angry at the right things. Righteous anger demands action. 
and Jesus took that kind of action. Second, that which is acceptable to society, I guess I'd add today even to religious leaders, is not necessarily acceptable to God. There are different standards that God has in place by which his people are to live. Finally, a third lesson, there are times when we need to show up, we need to speak up, and we need to stand up for the truth, no matter how hard it may be. I'm impressed then by the reaction of Jesus' disciples. Their reaction is guided by Scripture. We read in verse 17, His disciples remembered that it is written, Zeal for your house will consume me. It's a direct quote from Psalm 69.9. The Greek word for consume means to eat up. Uh, The place designed by God to express the glory of his presence, it has been desecrated and it was eating Jesus up. When the loss of the knowledge of who God is, When that settles in and an irreverent spirit starts to take root in our hearts, the results of that are devastating. I'm reminded of words penned by A.W. Tozer in his book, The Knowledge of the Holy. I've put these there so you can read them. With our loss of the sense of majesty has come the further sense, the further loss of religious awe and consciousness of the divine presence. We have lost our spirit of worship and our ability to withdraw inwardly to meet God in adoring silence. Modern Christianity is simply not producing the kind of Christian who can appreciate or experience the life in the spirit. The words, be still and know that I am God, mean next to nothing to the self-confident bustling worshiper, and look when this was written. In the middle period of the 20th century, it's a period that many of us look back at and say, oh, the good old days, when everything was really much, much better. So written in 1961, these words, I think, pronounce an even stronger indictment today. Allowing our hearts to be desensitized to the greatness and the holiness of God, it is at crisis proportions in the modern church. The key to understanding the big lesson for us hinges on our answer to this question. Where is the temple of God today? This passage has often been wrongly applied to make the point that there should never be activities like bake sales or other fundraising events in churches. That's not the point of the passage. While we need to exhibit care in what we do, just good common courtesy, this isn't the temple of God today. People commonly call the room in which we are meeting a sanctuary. A sanctuary, I actually looked this up, a holy place where the presence of God resides. This is not the sanctuary. We are where God lives today. We gather together to worship. And when that happens, this is a room where sanctuaries, sanctuaries of God's presence, where we meet to worship God. So we can say that Jesus really went after those scandalous religious teachers. What we should be asking, what about my life? What about my life? Hold on to that for a moment. We must come back to it before we leave this morning. The religious leaders totally missed the point that day. Just because you know something doesn't mean that you get it. They didn't get it. They challenged Jesus. The Jews then responded to him, what sign can you show us to prove your authority to do all this? Looking for a sign. 
Jesus answered them, destroy this temple, and I will raise it up again in three days. Jesus has come into what the religious leaders consider to be their place, where what they say, that's the only thing that matters, and Jesus has challenged that authority, and they want to know just who he thinks he is, and who gave him the authority, the right to do something so dramatic. The control that they wield over people, it's being threatened, and they demand, give us a sign. And Jesus' answer escapes their understanding. Because as Jesus is talking, I picture him pointing to himself rather than to the building. Not pointing to that physical building. As he gives them a look ahead at a sign that they won't be able to ignore. Jesus knows what's ahead. They are going to try to destroy him, but he'll be raised up again. But they continue down their same dead-end path. They replied, it's taken 46 years to build this temple, and you're going to raise it in three days? And then John adds this note of understanding, but the temple he had spoken of was his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples recalled what he had said, then. So for the disciples, then, three years out, they believed the scripture and the words that Jesus had spoken. There's a good historical tie here. Herod had begun building this temple in 19 B.C. It wouldn't be completed until 64 A.D. The building process is now in year 46. Uh, the building committee was in existence for quite a while. That means it's now the year about 27 AD. The chronological accuracy, it confirms the factual integrity of John as the author as he puts this into place. What Jesus was trying to do was to open their spiritual eyes of understanding, but they were only concerned about confronting him so that they could protect their prestigious positions and the money that came with it. Uh, there were, however, John tells us, those who did see and believe even during that week. Now, while he was in Jerusalem at the Passover festival, many people saw the signs he was performing. We know John records seven signs. Get the fingers right. He performed others. They're not recorded. John had a purpose in recording the ones he did so that we might believe. Other signs were performed. People saw those and they believed in his name. Jesus, however, would not entrust himself to them, for he knew all people. He did not need any testimony about mankind, for he knew what was in each person. People saw what the, he was doing. They were ready to follow, but uh, Jesus wasn't ready yet. He knew what was there, and later he would experience that crowd turning on him after shouting their hosannas as he's made known at the triumphal entry of Jerusalem. And just a few days later, those same people shouting their hosannas would be demanding his execution. And so he trusted himself simply to the Heavenly Father at this point and to him alone because Jesus understood what's in each person. Jesus knows and understands what's in each person. And he knows and he understands what's in you, who you are, and what you're all about. And so we come back now to the question we need to be asking. What about my life? What about my life? As a follower of Jesus who wants to grow and to honor Jesus, here are two questions we need to ask. The first one is this. I ask this as a person who has done, I've resisted, and over the years been involved with many people who doggedly resist. Why do we resist God when he seeks to cleanse the temples of our lives? We know he offers us the greatest gift that we can have in this life. The, uh, for all eternity, the relationship we have with him as our Savior. There are still those times, however, when we resist. 
and we refuse to surrender parts of our lifestyle, even when we know God's not pleased. Now, I'm not uh, moving toward legalism. We'll deal with that uh, in a few weeks. Jesus was never a legalist where he said, behavior is what determines your righteousness. Jesus is there where righteousness is to determine our behavior. What pleases God? Uh, Often our attitude sounds like this. My life may be a mess, but it's my mess. I'm used to this mess. I know how to deal with this mess. I kind of like this mess. There are those times when we need to invite Jesus to come in and clean house. Because we are simply done with allowing whatever is standing between Jesus and us to continue to exist. And so my second question is, how do I develop a godly zeal for this temple of God? We can certainly pray. And we can read scripture. Those are good activities. But we need to get to the heart of the matter. Here's the heart of the matter. The more I become convinced of the truth that I am owned lock, stock, and barrel by Jesus Christ, the greater my zeal will be to become the best temple I can be in which he can live. The Apostle Paul had that zeal. Uh, He wrote to Christians who struggled with immoral practices of the place where they lived in Corinth. In 1 Corinthians 6, he wrote to them, don't you realize that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and was given to you by God? You do not belong to yourself, for God bought you with a high price. So you must honor God with your body. In a recent devotional written by a pastor for pastors, he mentions a friend of his who grew up in the city of Corinth. He asked her what it's like to read Paul's letter to the Corinthians when you are a Corinthian. He says that she smiled at him and said, people haven't changed much. As those who are included in the group defined as people. Here's the takeaway for this day. Zeal begins with the desire that your body be a place where a holy God can feel at home. The Apostle John was there that day in the temple. And I witnessed when Jesus picked up the whip clean house. Jesus displayed this divine refusal to put up with blatant impurities. And then John says, Jesus knows what's in each person. And so this leaves us really with this one answer, one question to answer. What does Jesus need to drive out of my life? And actually this morning as I was thinking about it, maybe even better, what does Jesus want to drive out of my life? We're going to pray today and there is not going to be a lot of pressure with this other than from the Holy Spirit. Being able to be thankful that Jesus deals patiently with us, I am so glad that Jesus deals patiently with us. He doesn't expect this to be overnight process. 
He deals with us over the course of our lifetime. But just because he's patient, it doesn't mean that his zeal, that our lives be a place where he can feel at home, that that's any less. So in your notes today on that uh, listening guide, you'll find a prayer that I, uh, it's written by Chuck Swindoll. And it's in your notes, and I'm going to read through it, and then in just a moment, the worship team is going to come. And they'll be here to sing, just as I am. Just as I am without one plea. And it will be your opportunity to just talk with Jesus. To say, Jesus, here's my temple offered to you. What's your desire for this temple? Here's the prayer. Lord, I recognize you as the owner of my temple. I willingly submit to the authority of your word. Here comes the place where no one else can do this for you. I confess that I have allowed the corruption of to take up space that is reserved for worshiping you. You may need to pause at that point and just talk with the Spirit. I freely admit that I do not have the power to remove it on my own. Please cleanse me, even if I must endure hardship or suffer affliction in the process. Grant me the courage to remain steadfast as you work. Grant me patience to endure the process and provide extra encouragement when my patience wears thin. Then let me rejoice when your temple is again pure. I make the same request as David did so many years ago. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God. I ask this in the matchless name of Jesus. Amen. And so as we sing, you pray. And you ask the Spirit of God, is there something that you want to write in to that blank that's in the prayer for my life? And then... Give it back. Yeah. 